Welcome to character class. Today we're going to talk about an important document that relates to the education of young men and women, and certainly relates to character education. It's from 1744, and it's called From the Indians of the Six Nations to the College of William and Mary. Let's begin. In June of 1744, as recorded by Benjamin Franklin, who was a later to become a founding father decades later, the College of William and Mary in Virginia invited the Iroquois Confederacy, then known as the Indians of the Six Nations, to send 12 young men to their college to be, quote unquote, properly educated. Soon after, William and Mary received the following reply. Sirs, we know that you highly esteem the kind of learning taught in colleges and that the maintenance of our young men while with you would be very expensive to you. We are convinced, therefore, that you mean to do us good by your proposal. And we thank you heartily. But you who are wise must know that different nations have different conceptions of things. And you will therefore not take it amiss if our ideas of this kind of education happen not to be the same with yours. We have had some experiences of it. Several of our young men and young people were formerly brought up at the College of the Northern Provinces. They were instructed in all your sciences, but when they came back to us, they were bad runners, ignorant of every means of living in the woods, unable to bear either cold or hunger, knew neither how to build a cabin or take a deer or kill an enemy spoke our language imperfectly, and were therefore neither fit for hunters, warriors, nor counselors. They were totally good for nothing. We are, however, not the less obliged by your kind offer, though we decline accepting it. And to show our grateful sense of it, if the gentlemen of Virginia will send us a dozen of their sons we will take care of their education, instruct them in all we know, and make men of them. Now, that letter has some very big words into it, and, and we call that taking some of that in a sort of a sarcastic tone. If you saw what the Iroquois' response was, it was simply to say, your education's poor, but if you want to really instruct men you send them to us, send yours to us. And this is the idea of different forms of education. Now let's break down some of these words, because I want to make sure we understand them. The first one is the word esteem. Think of that word, esteem. Esteem means to hold very high. Someone who is esteemed has a very good reputation, for example. So that's what esteem means. The other one is maintenance. Maintenance, the idea of maintaining something is to take care of something. So when we say maintenance, we mean we're, is the concept of taking care. The concept of taking care of something, or many things. It could be a piece of equipment, which you will be doing downstairs in our trade school, or it could be the maintenance of how we instruct, how we properly do things, how we make sure we have the right curriculum. The right design of curriculum, for example. You're in the James Irwin program, so we want to maintain our program. That's the maintenance of teaching. Okay. And clearly, the College of, Virgin Mar uh, of William and Mary has maintenance in their own program to maintain their teaching, maintain instruction of their young men. Okay. Next one is the word. It has a hash to it, and that word is convinced. Notice that when I write it, there's an E there. Back then, in old spelling... E wasn't there, they put an apostrophe. Convinced means to argue and to make people uh, believe in your reasoning, your argument, or your evidence. That's what to convince is. To say, I agree with you after what you've told me. I am convinced. Okay. In this case, they're convinced that the intent of the College of, Mary, of William and Mary was a true intention, that they really cared about the Iroquois Confederacy. And they thank them heartily, as you know. And the next, the next word, heartily, means, means real, very big, deep. A hearty laugh, a hearty meal is a big meal, a big laugh. 
heartily means to say you generally really truly mean it. So the Iroquois are saying here, we understand that you mean well. We don't think you're being devious, that you mean well. What's another word? Another word is conception of things. We talked about that maintenance. A concept to conceive, to create an idea. An idea is a conception. Okay. Again, to conceive, to produce, to birth. Now, a miss is the next word. I'm going to write it up top so we don't lose uh, focus. A miss means it's off. Here they're saying, we, we don't want you to take this wrong, uh, incorrectly. Please don't take our, our response back to you incorrectly. Although later on they said, why don't you, instead of us sending you 12 of our guys, would you sell 12 of our guys? We'll, sh we'll show them how, how to be truly educated, right? In maintenance, in wood, and heat, and cold, to suffer physically, to be trained, to be tough, right? That's their idea there. But here they're saying, please don't, please don't disregard our, our intent here. Please don't be misinterpreting it, right? And the next word is something you've seen before. You've heard it before. It's not always, but it's, it's written differently. This one is imperfectly. You know what perfect means? Imperfectly is the concept that it's off. Here they're saying they came back and they could not speak our language. Spelling imperfectly, right? So imperfect means not to be able to spell the language. Yeah. And then later on you see the word obliged. Obliged without an E. Again, there's that old spelling with an apostrophe instead of an E. Obliged means to promise. To be obligated means you must do something. You internalize something. I am obligated to do my best in school. I am obligated to do my homework. Okay? That's what we mean by that. And then the next one, I know you know what, have a good concept of what hunters and warriors mean, but we need to touch upon this. I'm going to draw this and write this in red, counselors. Counselors here, I think they gave you two L's in it. Normally counselors, counselors are with one L, so I'm going to write that in with one L. It's a normal spelling we have. There in the Old English, they had two in the reading that you have. Well, what's a counselor? Well, today there's a very different meaning. I mean, these meanings are generally the same today, but this is not the same. We say counselor, someone who is wise, that is imparting instruction to give counsel to. Um, there, there's me being a teacher. There's me being a coach. There's me being a mentor. That's why I don't call myself a teacher. I am an instructor because I am a coach, a mentor, and a teacher. All three of those things. Counselor is a job that I have to do. We have an education what are called trained counselors. The Iroquois would say that's absolutely not the case with them. What a counselor is who can do all those things and has done all those things, take a deer, build a cabin, tolerate cold and hunger through many, many years, and learn how to deal with that. Someone who has actually been a hunter and a warrior and a family man. You can't be a counselor if you're none of those things in the Iroquois environment. You know. Think of it, would you want to take advice from somebody who's never been to war and going to tell you what to do? Would you like to take advice from, from somebody who has not been medically trained? Well, maybe, but what if that medically trained person has absolutely no idea about raising a family or have any idea about love or any idea about war or any idea? This is what the Iroquois are saying. Counselor has to have experience, has to have real experience, real wisdom. And this is the foundation of the, of the Iroquois education system. Now we must get into that, about what their concept is. Because the Iroquois is one other word. And this, the Six Nations, were a confederacy. When I said the Iroquois confederacy, maybe some of you may have said, I'm kind of confused. Isn't that sort of the confederacy of the South during the Civil War? And that is true. What confederacy really means is a weak central government. Even before we had a constitution, which you will study in character, that's very important, you must. Even before we had that, we had what was called the Articles of Confederation, which was a system of government. That means a weak central government. It often does not work. Well, why did it work for the Iroquois? Well, 
The reason why I went is they were in the Iroquois society, and we'll get into our society later, but not now. In the Iroquois society, the individual is there, but the individual is not powerful. Okay? And this happens to many tribal societies. The society itself is, is a little bit bigger. Okay? The tribe is very big. That's the most dominant feature of uh, Native American living, is the focus on the tribe. And this happens in other places in the world, too. But what about that system of government, G for government? Well, the Iroquois Confederacy is actually small. The most powerful is the tribes. If the tribes make with other, the other decisions, they make the daily decisions on life. The tribe does. So when you have six nations or six tribes, the only time government is powerful is when they decide to all go to war at the same time. But it must be through tribal approval. If you look at today some of the problems with this structure, not only here but across the world, it's socialist because the individual stuff and everything else can be taken away from it. So you must understand when we say six nations, we're not saying a very strong centralized national government among the six nations. The tribes still decide everything. So you must understand that system that they have, which is, of course, very different at before the revolution. The American Revolution didn't have this. The king was the, the source of government. And of course, that didn't work either. So we're going to get into that later on. But this is the Confederacy. And what they're saying here is that people have different concepts of education. Not one size fits all. And that's the most important part about this letter, is to the College of William & Mary, we know you have one way of instructing. And we've been through it before, but we do not value it. Think about your education. Why are you here at this trade school? Why are you here at the James Irwin system? Maybe you believe that character is more important. Your, your parents are like, look, this, this role of mother and father is important to us. And we want to have more say in our education. Think about the trade school itself. You, you may not take up a trade, but many of you will, and many of you will do other things. Many of you will take this trade and use it in your home life or in a subsequent business or you will grow into the building, or the engineering, or you'll do some of that and then you'll move on to, to higher level things. You'll go on to different things. You may even go on to a four-year education. Many have talked about that, paying their way through college and use it. So you have very, we all have very different concepts of education, even within the trade school. And this is what this is all about. One size does not fit all in education. We'll see you on the high ground.